Okay. Um, welcome uh, to the September webinar. Um, before we start, so our, our topic for, for tonight, or rather this evening, is how to make and, and change habits. Uh, before we start with this, I would like you, to, uh, like you to take a look at the poll that I've made uh, so that you can vote on what our topic for next month will be. Uh, every time when, when you send me questions, there are always suggestions for topics. This one was among one of the previous ones. So I thought it would be a good idea to let you choose among a few options that I thought were interesting and that were often proposed. So by the time we end the webinar, I will also end the poll and then I will tell you what the topic for next month will be. Um, as always, uh, during my talk, you can use the Q&A uh, button there to ask any questions you like about the webinar or really anything that you would like to know about skin picking or, well, hack even psychology in general. Uh, I will be talking for about um, 45 minutes. And I know I say that every time and then I speak longer, I, I will do my absolute best to actually stick to the schedule this time and then we'll start answering your questions and you know during my talk ask away and i will start one by one afterwards we don't have any any determined time for the q a so i will try to go as long as as i possibly can so without further delay let's start so this is me obviously with pre-covid hair um so i wanted to before we start just like last time uh, the skin pick uh, is giving a discount. So let me just move this so that you can actually see what the code is. So for the next seven days, people who join and who attended the webinar will get a $60 discount for the first month, uh, courtesy of skin pick for their program. Uh, so just make sure to use the code in the corner if you need that. I will put the code in the end as well. So if you don't write it down now, that's okay. I just can't look at myself that long. So this is what we'll be covering uh, today. Uh, so we'll talk just a little bit about what are habits anyway, um, what are intentions and motivations and why and how they can help with habit formation. And we'll talk about different stages in how to develop a habit. And through all this, I will try to just add as many practical tips as possible. Uh, the reason why I chose this topic and why it was suggested in the first place is because of the habit reversal training. And one important part of this habit reversal training is establishing a new habit that is supposed to compete with skin picking. So as part of the, of the training, we always talk about different strategies and how to pick a proper competing response, but we very rarely actually address the topic of how to, to form and maintain habits in the most efficient way. So I thought when this topic was proposed, I thought it would be a really nice way to, for you to maybe learn something that's actually practically useful, but also at the same time, something that people who are already in the program can also benefit from. Because the content that I will share here is not something that's included in the program. I might discuss different parts of this with my clients, but it's not a default that's built into the program. So I thought it would be something that everyone could use in a way. Uh, so let's start. Let me just move myself back into the right corner now. I really have to consider that my camera will be on screen when I make these presentations every time I move around the camera. So let's start by sort of first saying what is it that we're talking about and what are habits anyway. So th this is the simplest definition that I was able to find, and I think it's really to the point and efficient. So habits are automatically triggered actions in specific circumstances. So there are three key words here, but I marked two because I want to say something more about them. First, they're automatic, which means that it's not something you have to think about. Second, is that they are actions. When we say the word action, what we usually mean is that we do something. And of course, most of the habits are doing something. However, habits don't have to, only, don't have to be only when you do something, they can also be the way you think. So it's essentially when any kind of pattern activates. There are habits of thought as there are habits of behavior. Um, to give you an example, like a habit that most of us have is brushing our teeth twice a day, right? So that's a habit of behavior. Skin picking, in a way, is a habit as well. I don't think it would be correct to reduce skin picking to a habit alone, 
but it most certainly has that aspect as well. A habit of thought would be the kind of pattern of thought that activates in certain circumstances. So for example, um, one of the previous webinars, someone asked about anxious attachment style, and that's a topic that I frequently visit at fashion styles when I work with clients. Um, each attachment style has specific habits of thinking. So when a person has anxious attachment style, their, their, their thought habit is to think rejection and to think about being left, for example. So every time your, your loved one does something that even slightly deviates from what you ex expect, the immediate habit that you have is to think something's wrong in the relationship. So that's a thought habit. That would be one example. Another thing would be that, for example, as a therapist, I frequently, when people talk, my, my, my default way of listening is to think, what are the common themes in what they're saying now? Or why is this important to them? It's, it's like a reflex that I, it's not something that I consciously decide to think about. It's just the way that my brain is, is taught to think because most of my days I spend sitting and listening to people and thinking of well, why is this important to them and what is it that they mean when they say this. So that's all, that also kind of due to repetition, it became a habit. So a habit can be really anything that is triggered without conscious intent in, in a given set of circumstances. Uh, one way to think about habits is like art styles. So I was thinking Monet, for example, because uh, confession, I don't like Van Gogh very much, but so Monet was the second one that came to my mind as having a very specific style. You really don't have to be a historian of art to see a painting and say, well, this is Monet, right? His subject matter differs. Uh, even, even his style sort of changed slightly over the years as his eyesight changed and of course, as he became more proficient. But there is something very specific that is always the same, that always repeats itself when he paints. So that would be his habit, for example. So habits are conditioned patterns. That kind of is something that everyone can already tell. That's something that we cannot control. But I would, when we say that it's something that we cannot control, I do have to add something here. There is a difference between a habit and a compulsion. A compulsion is something that we have to do. So, uh, there, we usually talk about two types of picking, like the one that we're conscious of, like focus picking, and then mindless or automatic picking. Sometimes you simply catch yourself picking. That could be the habitual aspect of it. For example, you're reading a book or watching Netflix or whatever else you may be doing, and then suddenly you realize that you're picking, right? And then when you realize that you're picking, you can stop. So that's a habit. But then there are those situations when you absolutely must pick. That would be a compulsion. And I think this is a very, very important distinction to make. And this is why I said that I think it's wrong to reduce picking to just being a habit because it has both aspects to it. We don't control habits in the sense that we're simply not aware of them. I don't need to exert any special control over brushing my teeth because it's just something that I do. I wake up, I go downstairs, I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth. It's something that I can stop and nothing bad will happen, and I'm not going to feel like I'm going to have an anxious attack. So that, that there's a very important distinction there. There's no control because most habits are simply not conscious, but it's not that we cannot control them. They're not intentional, or they're, rather they don't feel intentional, again, because we don't control them because they're not conscious. And they make us more efficient. So this is something that's a good side of habits. I will talk about this a little more when we get into the psychology behind habits. If this is your first webinar, then you're maybe not familiar with my obsession with this person. But if this is not your first webinar, then I suppose you were just wondering at, one po at what point is Kelly's picture going to show up? So let's ask Kelly what habits are. As, you, as always, I think he has very insightful ideas about human behavior, and he offers a perspective that most other psychologists don't. I'm going to send you, uh, along with this webinar, you're going to receive a paper that I found that talks about habit formation from a more traditional point of view. So, and I will also present that as well, different stages in habit formation. But I'm, I just want to give you a piece of sort of alternative thinking, let's say, a different approach. So Kelly, Kelly's general idea was an obvious one that every, every psychologist that ever existed made, which is that 
our life takes place on different levels of awareness. There are behaviors that we're very highly aware of and then behaviors that we're not. But for Kelly, this was slightly different. He thought in terms of what we can convey with words and what we cannot convey, convey with words. And that was a very important distinction for him. So he said that our psyche functions on different levels of awareness. There are some things that we can very easily say with words. If you ask me whether or not I want this webinar to be interesting and useful, or do I want it to be boring and uneventful, well, I'm obviously going to opt for the former, right? Uh, hopefully that will turn out to be that way, but if it doesn't, that's what I wanted to achieve anyways. So there are some things that we can very easily put into words. I like this, or I don't like this, right? When we communicate things with words, it's something that other people can also very easily understand. This is what we usually mean by conscious things. It's what we can very easily understand and, and use words to express. Then as we go deeper to kind of lower levels of awareness, we start losing words. And instead of words, we get other ways of symbolizing things. So we have uh, music, for example, or visual symbols. On very low levels of awareness, we have body sensations. And then we have automatic behaviors, also deep, deep down there. So the difference that I like to sort of to show, to kind of make to show to people what's the difference between high and low levels of awareness is a different be difference between reading a scientific journal and a difference and, and reading poetry on the other side. When you read a scientific journal, every term that you use or read about is precisely defined. Sentences are clear because the goal is to communicate something very accurately. When you read poetry, very frequently your intellect is not going to be helpful in understanding both. You can talk about different ways of writing or you know, whatever else literary theorists have invented to talk about poetry, but the meaning of the poem itself is something that you usually feel. I will give you a few examples of this and then explain how this is tied to emotions in, in, in just a minute. But from this slide, there's just one thing to remember, which is that habits are those parts of those aspects of our behavior that we cannot easily express with words. So it's something that we don't do with conscious intention. It's just something that kind of does itself in the background. So for Kelly, making things unconscious, it's not just a matter of repressing what's unacceptable, what's undesirable, what's difficult to understand. It's also a matter of a kind of psychological economy, if you will, or psychological pragmatism. The example that he uses in his book in the beginning of the first volume, if I remember, is that, that breathing is a prime example of why some things should not be conscious. We are, of course, we can be conscious of our breathing, especially if we practice mindfulness, right? We will specifically focus on our breathing. But essentially, the process of breathing is not something that we have under our control. It is controlled by mechanisms that are not conscious. And this is very good for us because that means that we can devote a lot of our capacities to other things. A more mundane example would perhaps be walking. I really like to walk. So I, I will go on a walk that's like 25 miles. So that's my idea of a walk. And most of the time, I don't have to consciously decide which leg needs to go first, right? It's just something that my body does. And then as I walk, I will listen to an audiobook or just look around and, you know, admire the architecture if there's anything to be admired, or I just look at people or do something else. But the point is, is that my body does many, many things, but at the same time, I cannot control any of them. I can consciously stop my breathing for a while, but then at some point, my, my body will take over. And according to Kelly, this is a very good thing. We make processes unconscious so that we can retain a kind of high cognitive space for things that actually matter in everyday life. Imagine trying to do this webinar while having to consciously think about um, breathing or which muscles I need to move to open my mouth or produce a sound. It's kind of clear why evolutionarily speaking, it is very good for things to be automatic and habitual. So whereas when you talk about skin picking, your first instinct may be habits bad, habits let's change them, habits let's get rid of them. Habits are actually very good and they structure a good portion of not only our psychological life and our, I guess biological life, you can't really say that, but our kind of physical existence, 
they also have a lot to do with social relations. You say hi to people most of the time without any conscious intention. You just do that when you see another person. So there are so many things that habits are good for. And there are also many reasons why we want to keep things habitual. And there are also many reasons why we want to introduce some things as, ha as habits as well. The problem with this that Kelly noticed, but also other psychologists as well, is that when something is not conscious, then it's really hard to deal with it and change it. And also when something is not conscious, even when you replace that with another process that is not conscious, which is something that we do as part of habit reversal training, which is the first half of skin pick, um, you, the, the old behavioral patterns still exist somewhere. This is why we talk about competing responses and not replacement responses, right? Because we create a habit that competes with the other habit, but the other habit is still there lurking in the background somewhere. This will come in handy when we talk about habit formation, so keep that in mind. For now, just remember that habits are good because they allow us to delegate certain things while we focus on other things. So it's like, a, it's really like a way to have a personal assistant in your mind. So we kind of suppress things, not just because they're bad or, I don't know, strange, but also because it's useful to do so. Now, because habits don't operate on high levels of awareness, when we want to change them, we cannot really talk ourselves out of habits. And this is what I see people do all the time. They will tell themselves, okay, you need to stop this, or this is not very useful to do. And this doesn't really work because habits don't operate on the level of words. And therefore we have to find a way of communicating with those other parts of our minds, ways that they can understand, or at least meet them halfway. Meaning that you can start with a conscious, highly intellectualized, rational strategy, but then you have to operationalize that strategy on a level at which that part of your mind functions. If habits exist on the level of what our bodies do automatically, then this is the level of communication with our bodies that we have to go down to or go up to, I guess, depends on what you look at. If there's anything that, that's not clear until now, by all means, just ask questions and we will go through all this. I'm trying, Kelly's theory is sometimes difficult to explain because he doesn't use any words that normal psychologists use. So it's, it, when I translate it, I'm never sure if I've communicated it very clearly. I'm going to give you two examples here of how certain types of communication between people or inside one person, as the case may be, require different levels of symbol symbolization. You have, there are two examples that I want to give you here. They kind of both boil down to the same thing. It's just a matter of what works better for you. Uh, let's start with the example on the left. So this is a photograph. Uh, from a performance called Rest Energy from 1980 by Marina Abramovich and Ulai. This was a very short performance. It only lasted a few minutes. And this picture is not a spectacularly aesthetically brilliant image, so it's not like a piece of art in itself. But the performance is one of the most powerful artworks that I have ever seen. It's, it's really powerful. And I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to walk you through the performance. And then you try to feel the performance. Don't think about the idea. Just try to put yourself in their shoes. So the, the, both of them had microphones attached to their chest. And the microphones were attached to speakers. So everyone in the audience could hear their heartbeats very loudly. They took, obviously, a bow and an arrow. She leaned on, and so did he. But he's only holding the arrow with a few fingers of, of his one hand. And they're kind of stretching the, the bow with, uh, with the weight of their bodies. So no one is actually in control there, right? The arrow is very sharp, obviously. It's a real arrow, and it's pointing directly to her heart. Marina Bramovich said that this is the, the, the most difficult and most dangerous performance that she ever did. And if you know her work, you know that she's done some, well, crazy stuff. So this says a lot that she thought this was the most dangerous one. So the arrow is pointed right in her heart. Ula is holding it only with a, few, with a few fingers. I don't see how many. If his fingers tremble even slightly, she's dead. There's no first aid that you can do there. So her life, 
hinges on his fingers, sustaining the tension of the of the bow and the arrow and her weight and his weight. Isn't that terrifying? Can you imagine the level of trust and vulnerability and, and intimacy and love that you have to have for someone to allow them to come that close? I don't think words actually convey the terror. Just try to put yourself in her shoes for a second and tell me if you can possibly imagine yourself with that arrow so close to your heart. And then tell me that you can explain with words exactly how that feels. Maybe a more practical example, something that most of us have in our experience, even if we don't like performance art, is music. Music can make us feel in ways that we can really never quite convey with words. There are some things that, um, some things that we can say, like this made me sad or this made me happy, but then there are pieces of music that we can hear and they can completely drive us crazy and there's no way that we can explain that with words. One situation that I had in my life with this, and to this day I still have that reaction to that music, is Prokofiev's third piano concerto. I used to be very ambivalent about Prokofiev. Like intellectually, I understood what he was getting at and I, I can I understand like what, what he tries to achieve with music. I can hear what he wants, but I never quite felt it. And then I came across Martha Argerich's performance, that's the, the woman in the, the picture here, of his third piano concerto. And so I started listening and then, you know, you slowly get hooked and you think, okay, so she's doing something different. You know, wow, this is really powerful. And then as the third movement starts, my body just starts exploding. Even now, as I'm saying this, I'm trying to find a description of it. It doesn't make me sound like a crazy person, but I feel like there's like a volcano exploding. If you've ever heard that piece, like the end of the third movement, there's so much drama and noise and energy, and it's just so crazy and chaotic. And there's just, I don't know how to explain it. I'm, I see that my tone is rising as I speak. And I'm kind of becoming red in my cheeks. Like I have a genuine reaction right now. And I cannot explain it to you. The only way that I can possibly convey this to you is if I play it, but don't worry, I'm not going to put you through that. You can find it online if you like. There are many of her performances of that piece because she does it brilliantly and very frequently. But the only way that I can actually convey this to you is if I play it very loudly and then kind of stare at you like this and say, do you feel it? Do you feel it? Do you feel it now? I can kind of point to moments in the piece when I feel something but there's no way that I can explain what I feel with words. This is what it means when something is of low levels of awareness, according to Kelly. There are just no words that you can kind of talk about it. Now, as I'm listening to myself and the way I'm explaining this, I'm thinking, you know, how bizarre this must sound to you because there are just no words to explain it. My body just, I don't know, sets on fire, explodes from the inside. It's like a, panic attack in a good way. I, I don't know how to explain it. So the same goes for habits as well. Many of them we do, but it's very hard to explain why we do them, even though there's obviously a reason why we do them, and there's obviously a reason why I react the way I do to that music. But the experience itself is very tacit. It's very nonverbal. And then when we try to convey these experiences, uh, art is very good, the body is very good, but words are not very good. And if words are not very good, that means that this kind of typical logical reasoning is also not going to get us far. So when you work on implementing a new habit, you have to understand what that habit will mean to the, for your body. So that the, the part of you that actually does the habit. I hope this, this, this makes sense. I will again try to bring this down a little later to very practical examples. But I hope you understand the, the, my, my main point, which is that you cannot argue with your body. You cannot talk your liver into working properly. You cannot talk your uh, chest into having certain sensations. You can listen, you can learn, and then you can try to use that. It's like learning a new language, basically. If I want to communicate this idea effectively to you, the best chance I have, I believe, is speaking English. But I could do this lecture in Italian or Hungarian or, I don't know, Spanish, whatever you like. But what is the chance that everyone will understand me? So I have to use the language that people understand, not just any language that I speak in that comes to my mind. So in, in, that, in that sense, when you also communicate to your body, 
you have to use the language it understands. A very good example of this is that when you play certain music, your mood changes because it's like sending communication to your body. It's like opening another line of, of conversation, starting a topic. I'm sure if you have this situation that, that you just hear a song somewhere and just like this, you become sad. This is because that is a line of communication that your, your body understands. So that's what we have to work with. That's the level that we have to kind of go down. But when I say go down, I don't mean like it's a less, I don't think it's a less sophisticated language, but I say down because it's a lower level of awareness. So now let's just go through the practicalities of how you actually establish new habits. Uh, the fragment on the image below is, is by Thomas Sanchez, a Cuban painter that I like very much. He paints these imaginary metaphysical landscapes. And he's also one of the painters whose habits I recognize very easily. Even when I've never seen the painting, when I, when I see it, I immediately recognize the, the style. So there are three main phases in, in, in the process of, of habit formation. The first stage is initiation. In many ways, this is the, the most important stage, and you will see why. Then there's the learning phase, and then there's the, 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 the phase of stability of the habit. This is not a phase in which you can be lazy and not do anything, but it is a phase when you don't have to try very hard to establish a habit. It's a phase when you actually maintain the habit. And I will also mention a little bit when we get to that part, why is, why is this important to consider? Because most people, when they, when they will go through initiation, they will go through a learning, and then they will say, well, okay, so I've done it for, I don't know, 10 weeks, 60 days, whatever current number they will find online, and then, or they will just have the feeling that it's now an established habit, and then the habit will go away, because they're not sort of maintaining the habit properly. Fortunately, we have to maintain those. So let's start with the first with the first phase. So it's initiation. In this in this phase, we have to make sure that we have a proper intention and proper motivation to establish a habit. When I'm talking about intention setting, I don't really mean anything particularly new agey. I, it's a very practical thing. So before you start doing anything, you have to have a clear idea of what is it that you're doing and why. So that that's very important. Uh, I will give you mindfulness as an example. So that was our topic for last month. So I've, I've received a lot of questions about that. So it's still sort of in my mind because I'm, I'm answering the, the, the emails. People get very excited when they hear about mindfulness, especially if they like to read about kind of esoteric or new age stuff. And then they will find all these like remarkable things that people do with meditation. And then they become very excited. And it's like, okay, I want this. Like, yeah, I, I want to learn meditation. And then can you teach me meditation? And I say, okay, I'll teach you. And then I teach the meditation. And then they're like five days in. Yeah, I don't think I can really find 10 minutes per day to do this. Or I really wanted to, but then I forgot. And then it turns out that the reason why they actually leave the habit or why they forget about the habit is because they don't have any clear idea about why they're doing it. Unless you have a very clear goal that you try to achieve, introducing a new habit will be very difficult. Even, pardon the comparison, but even when you train a dog, you know exactly why you're training the dog to do a specific thing. So you need to know exactly why you're doing something and you need to find a very clear way to send that message to, all, to you on all the levels of, of awareness. So before you start introducing a new habit, for example, a competing response, you first have to be very clear with yourself about what is it that you want to achieve. Because it's the goal that will drive you to get there. Motivation is not going to just fall from the sky. So it's not enough to say, I want to introduce a habit because I want to stop picking, for example, if we're talking about competing responses. This is obviously the ultimate goal, but it is not a very well-defined goal. Because you can stop picking in 100 ways. What, what a better way to formulate an intention would be is to say, I'm going to introduce this specific habit so that I don't pick, let's say, when I watch TV. If you remember what, what, I, was, what I was saying previously, habits are limited to a context. The context can be wide or narrow, but they always exist in a context. 
So if you just say I want to stop picking and picking take pl takes place in several contexts, then this is not a good way to establish a habit. So you need to have a precisely defined concept. Kelly would call that a range of convenience. He says every construct, like every tool that we have, is only applicable in certain areas. So we have to have that area clearly defined. When you pick your competing responses, you have to know where you will apply them. So if you have one for when you, I don't know, when you work or when you're in a meeting or one when you're in the bathroom or one when, I don't know, when you're alone in the bedroom, whatever, but you have to really clearly define where the habit will take place. Then you have to define also what is it that you will lose by introducing a habit. If what you will gain is to, for example, stop picking when you're in the bathroom, what is it that you will lose? This is not very intuitive for most people to think, but when you're replacing behavior A with behavior B, because they're not obviously identical behaviors, they don't have all the same benefits. The obvious benefit of a competing response over picking is that you minimize the damage that you do to your skin, right? It gives you a degree of control, let's say, as well. But then there is also a loss. If picking didn't do something, it wouldn't be there in the first place. So you need to be very clear about what is it that you will lose as well? Because the new habit will cover only one part of what picking used to do, but not all of it. So if you make a Venn diagram, they will overlap significantly, but then there will be one narrow part that only belongs to picking. And that is what you will lose. Then you need to consider what are potential sources of resistance. Whenever we introduce a new habit, we get something, we lose something, and this shift that takes place can sometimes cause resistance. Resistance is not always like a very powerful, violent emotion. It can also be very subtle. It can come in the form of an excuse. It can come in the form of you giving yourself permission to just skip that for today. Uh, very frequently when we when I do the first part of the program, when we, when we are in the habit reversal stage, people will say things to me like, uh, well, I gave myself permission to pick yesterday because I was very tired. That's a point of resistance because you have the choice to apply the new habit or to resist applying the new habit and you chose to resist applying the new habit. Resistance is a normal thing. It's a way for our psyche to protect, it, to protect itself. Our psyche is very lazy in that sense. It will only change when it has to. So in that sense, resistance is a normal phenomenon that happens all the time not just when it comes to introducing new habits, but for anything. Especially if you're a grumpy person, like whatever new thing that people suggest, your impulse might as well be to say, well, no. But then when you give it some thought, then you realize that it's not that bad, and then you kind of give in. We see this on a personal level, we see this on the group level, we see this even on the societal level. Like a very obvious example of this is when you look at polling for gay marriages, for example. When, when they were first legalized, it, it, or when the initiative first appeared, they were not very popular. Then over time, as people kind of habituated to the idea, it, the, the support grew, and now the support is, is quite high. And this is not because, you know, gay marriages changed in some way. It's just that, that as they became more common, as people got the chance to explore what this means and what the implications are for this, their resistances melted away because they could see that some of their fears some of the threats that they felt didn't really come to pass. And the same goes for also individual level. When, when you introduce a new habit, there will be resistance to it, but as you sort of slowly explore the resistances, they will melt away. But you have to zoom in on them and really, really study them. You have to be aware of them. Sometimes we can predict them, and when we can, we should. So when you plan a new habit, you should always factor in what might be potential source of resistance. If there are some of you that are advanced in the program right now, so session six has one, one worksheet that deals specifically with what will stop you from achieving your goals. So that's something that we also talk about in different contexts, but this is very important to, to think about. If you do journaling, uh, this is a great thing to journal about before you actually decide to create a competing response. Because that way you can 
see what goes on in your psyche, what your reasons for change are, what your motivation is, and how much of it there is. And then the last part that you have to do in the preliminary stage, it's to kind of devise the exact mechanics of the new habit and precise ways in which it will be embedded in a certain context. Because remember, we're supposed to make behavior automatic in a certain context. It means that it has to be simple, or at least simple enough for us, because what's simple will obviously differ from person to person. And then it has to be easily embeddable, and it has to be easily put into practice. I don't want to make up words, you know. What does this mean? If we're talking about replacing picking with a healthier habit, that means that you already have a set of behaviors in the very act of picking that your body has automated already. Let's say if you pick your face, that could be the movement of your hand towards your face. So that's something that you already, especially if your picking is mindless many, a lot of times, so that's something that's already automated. So that's one behavior that you already have as a habit. You can take advantage of this. When you introduce a competing response, you can make sure to utilize this part and then just add something to that. So instead of picking, you will, I don't know, fix your hair, if, if that makes any sense to you. So the motion is quite similar, but it has a different finish. If you're picking your feet, for example, which is also very frequent, that means that your legs have to be in a certain posture. If you're, hypothetically, if you're picking while you're reading a book, that means that your, your arms, or at least one of them, has to be close to your feet, and your feet have to be in a certain position. That means that you may be sitting in a habitual way. Pay attention to that. And then devise a very specific way, like you can literally write it down as a series of steps, what this new habit will entail. You can try it out as well. Because sometimes what you intellectually imagine is not necessarily something that your body will accept as easy or intuitive. So when you figure out what the competing response might be, just try practicing it a few times and see if it seems natural. It's not going to seem entirely natural since it's obviously a new behavior, but what you can do is see if it seems hmm, too artificial. Maybe that's a better way to phrase it. So let me give you uh, an example. We have a spinner ring here, which is something that people often find to be a useful competing response. And you have um, a worry stone. They do the same thing. You put the, finger, you put the ring on your, um, on your finger and then you spin it with your, with your hands and you can use this, hold it in your hand, and then just rub it with your finger. So basically the principle is the same. And yet, when, when people try them out, spinner rings work perfectly for some people because they're very convenient. When you put them on your, on your finger, you just carry them everywhere and you always have a competing response. For some people, they absolutely do nothing. For some people, worry stones will do the job. For some people, something else might have to do that will kind of engage their entire arm. So you have to try out and see what feels most natural to your body. To know what feels most natural to your body, guess what? You have to really see what your body's feeling as you're performing the action. So all this, this is why I said that the initiation phase is the most important one, because this is a lot of work. Like even just going through this slide took a lot of time and to actually deal with all these things will take time. So be patient and don't rush. Um, so second, we have to learn how to talk to the body. This sculpture, by the way, I didn't know, I couldn't find the name of the, of the exact sculpture, so I didn't put it in the corner like I usually do. It's by Carol Foreman, I think. Um, isn't it beautiful? She has a series of sculptures of swimmers. Um, it's really, really beautiful. And if you ever saw them in person, they're completely mesmerizing. So anyway, let's see how to talk to the body. When you're successful, reward yourself. It's very simple. What's the proper reward? Well, you have to ask your body for this. Again, this is a matter of what feels good, not what's logical to feel good. Make your expectations realistic. By this, I mean that you will fail. There's absolutely no way that you're not going to fail a few times when you're introducing a new habit. When people start skin pick, one thing that, that I think 80% of the people who have been picking for a long time will tell me, and that's this story. 
So I will sometimes I will ask people if they've had experiences with therapy or if they've been picking for 10 years, I will usually ask what they've tried in the past to deal with speaking so that we can see right off the bat what worked, what didn't work, so that we can learn from their previous experiences, right? It's kind of better to build from the past and just start from the scratch. And then they will say things like, I tried wearing gloves or I tried um, wearing band-aids or I tried using digits or, you know, one of these typical uh, things that people try. And then I will ask, well, what happened? And then the answer I get nine times out of 10 is, it worked for a week or it worked for a month. Then I failed and then I stopped. It's almost like once you, the, the response doesn't work, people get demoralized very quickly. And this is because on some level, again, maybe not consciously, they expect to succeed immediately. And think about it. If you've been picking for 10 years, aside from the psychological layers and what it means and what it does, just think of it on a very superficial level of having the same habit for 10 years. Why on earth would you expect that habit to disappear just because you started using a fidget? So we all fail. Introducing a competing habit is a long-term process. So you're not playing one game. That's like the league competition, what you're doing. You don't have to win every match. You don't have to win every point. You have to know that you will fail. Perfectionism is almost guaranteed to make you feel horrible. So you have to factor in failure. And then you have to find a constructive way to look at failures. I like to look at failures as questions. This may not work for you, so feel free to find whatever you know, works for you. Like what, what's the most useful perspective of failures? But I like to see them as questions because I understand them as my psyche telling me you didn't cover this, think about it a little more. If you fail because you're tired, that's something to think about. How do I get this tired without noticing? If I've noticed that I was tired, why didn't I actually do something to rest? So every failure is a chance for you to learn. Sometimes it's because you didn't choose an appropriate response. For example, um, if you choose to hold the remote control in your hand, well, if you go in a meeting at work, of course you're not going to have a competing response. That's an obvious flaw in the plan. So you have to go back, split the habit into two, and then find a better solution. But if, if the but if the answer is something like, well, I just gave myself, I was very angry, and then I gave myself the permission to pick, for example. Well, that's a more complex question. That failure requires you to go in a little bit deeper and see why is it that anger is a justification to pick. Like, what is it that picking does for anger that the habit you're trying to replace it with doesn't? Why is it that picking will make your anger somehow better and rubbing a worry stone wouldn't? Does that mean that for some situations you might need a more intense habit or a different way to cope with emotions? Again, it will be a different answer for different people. But if you see failures as, as an opportunity to learn something about how your mind works and how your body works, then it's not really a failure. It's a setback, setback at best, but it's not a failure. You have to be patient because the, how much time you need to implement a habit is very different. And it's obviously different from person to person, but it's not just from person to person. It's also from habit to habit. Some habits will take a long time. Um, to give you a, a, my own example, because I realized as I was debating the format of the of the, the the webinar, I didn't ask any clients for permission to share their examples. So I'm giving you very abstract examples, and I can give you personal examples. So one example of a habit that I had a very easy time establishing was morning meditation. I just when I realized that like a you know, several hundred years ago when I decided that I want to meditate and I want to do mindfulness regularly, I just said, fine, I'll just sit every morning. I knew that it's easier to establish a habit if you attach it to something that already exists. So I said, I'll just do meditation after I wake up and before I brush my teeth because my, I could put my meditation cushion on the way. I can just sit and then continue with my day. It was very easy. I never had any major setbacks. But then at one point, I decided to establish my meditation as being twice a day. And then the second uh, meditation in the day caused me a lot of problems because I had a clear morning routine and there was 
really a very specific context that I could embed my habit in. So it was very protected, cushioned, it was very easy to do. But then the afternoon one or the evening one was very difficult. If I do it too late, I'm very tired and then I'll tell myself, well, you're just going to fall asleep meditating anyway, so you just might as well skip it and sleep. If I do it too early, I will feel kind of too pent up and stressed from work, so I will not have a very easy time of kind of sliding into the meditation. If I do exercises before, I will spend too much time, then I'll eat dinner, and then again, I will fall asleep easier because I will eat this, this organizational mess. And then I realized one thing after failing endlessly, which is that my afternoon schedule doesn't allow me to have a precise time and that I have to introduce a flexible habit. And second of all, that a part of me actually doesn't want to do meditation right after work. I actually should be, and I am doing it now, but it took me a long time to break down that resistance. A part of me really didn't want to go deep into my mind after listening to other people's problems the whole day. Because I realized that I need to set better boundaries between work and my private life. So the question of resistance and failures to establish a habit actually led me to a wider point, which is how much of the content that I'm, expo that I'm exposed to during the day when I work with people, how much of it do I just carry over in my day? I obviously don't want to, which is exactly why I resisted meditation, but that was not me dealing with the content and learning how to draw boundaries, that was just me ignoring my own psyche. Kind of like when people avoid anger and then pick because they actually don't want to sit with the anger and understand the anger. So what I had to do was take a step back and deal with this bigger topic before I could go back and find a way to embed the habit in my routine, which is what I did, but it required me to fail. And so you have to be patient when you fail because you have to kind of keep your composure and distance so that you can analyze the situation and learn from it. Be precise. Like I said before, vague habits don't yield results. So you can't say I will meditate sometime when I wake up before I go to work. That's not a very good way to establish a habit. The way to go about doing that is to say, I will get out of bed, meditate, and then proceed the rest of my day. So what I did, for example, for this, and something that worked for me very well, was that I bought a meditation cushion and I put it right next to my bed. So that literally the first thing that I do when I wake up is sit on the bed and then fly down onto the meditation cushion. And I use a timer, which is not my phone because I don't keep my phone next to me because I really don't want to be exposed to the news that early. So that's literally the first movement that I make is just slide down to the meditation cushion. So, and that's a very precise operation. There, there, there's, there, there are no 10 cushions. It's not in the other room. There are no maneuvers that have to, it's very simple. You just slide down and sit. And then be mindful. And by this, I mean that you should really, when you, when you apply a new habit, you should really make a point of doing it slowly and consciously, because that way your body can also learn and absorb new information. And you can learn how you feel while you're doing it. And then you can identify potential obstacles or failures ahead of time. So it's not that you have to do meditation, I meant it more informally. Like, um, for example, now I'm sitting on a chair that's not very comfortable and I'm very mindful of my lower back. And that's, that's what I meant. Like you don't have to intensely focus on it, but you should kind of wake up and say, now I will do this. And then be very present as you do that. So just be with the experience. So patient, precise, mindful, very clear. Okay, so I have to explain why I insist so much on rewarding yourselves. Reward works, punishment doesn't work. Um, if I tell you to go to the crossroads and don't turn left, and you have, let's say, three or four other directions to go into, how on earth will you know where to go? If I tell you that this is not a webinar for people who struggle with bipolar disorder, Will you actually know who this webinar is for? Well, no, because that literally means anything except bipolar disorder, right? So uh, when you reward yourself, you're actually giving your mind and your body a precise direction to go into. I'm going to make the parallel with dogs because I have a dog, so I like dogs at least as much as I like humans. 
and on some days even more. So when I train my dog, I notice very easily that she reacts to getting treats. She's a very smart dog, which I guess every dog owner says about their dog, but she would learn something in only once or twice if I would give her a treat. If I say, sit, give her a treat. Next time I say, sit like this, she's sitting. But if I say no to something, she would never really understand because the only thing that she would get is you did something wrong. But you did something wrong is not a very clear instruction, especially not to someone who doesn't speak, but can only understand my tone or my gestures. And this, again, the same works for our bodies. Even when you raise, I don't know, when you raise a child, you have to give them principles. You don't give them what they're not supposed to do. You don't tell them you're not supposed to cheat on an exam. You tell them you're supposed to work hard. So we have to give them positive instructions. When you punish yourself, it's a negative instruction. It's just not this or not that way. So not useful information. Eventually you might actually understand, but it will take you much longer. If you give yourself positive instruction, the connection between the behavior, the reward will be established much faster. Again, I have to reiterate this point. And I kind of also wanted to find um, an excuse to show you this image because I love this monument. It's so impressive. Um, resistance is information. Failure is information. Anytime that something goes wrong or something is unplanned, that is your, mo your chance to learn more about how to be more efficient and also more about yourself. Sometimes, Resistance can reveal really very deep things because my resistance towards establishing an afternoon meditation practice actually told me something very important and taught me a big lesson, which is if you actually want to retain your sanity and be a therapist for a long time, then you have to draw these boundaries because you cannot run away from your brain. That's just not a viable way to live. It's not sustainable. So my resistance might have seemed minor like, uh, let me do it after I take a shower, or let me do it tomorrow, or I'll skip one day. But behind it was quite an important story. And then stability. After you sort of mindfully and, and intentionally introduce the habit and work on it, you will notice that over time, it will slowly become your second nature. First thing, do not rely on numbers that you find online. Uh, there are many studies that will assess how much time you need to establish a certain specific habit, but you always have to keep in mind that that study refers to a specific sample that is always very carefully chosen. It refers to a specific habit that you may or may not actually want to establish. So these numbers mean nothing. Some habits you will, you will establish very quickly. Some you will need a lot of time. What research says and what averages say and what people on Reddit or Quora or wherever you get your information for, from whatever they say, it doesn't matter. A habit will take as much time as it takes, period. Once it's established though, it's very important to be mindful, not so much of what you do because it is automatic at that point, but rather to those moments where you skip it. And you will skip it no matter how hard, hard how ingrained a habit is, there will be times when you will skip it, and that's normal and that's fine. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was trying to find, without giving too many of my examples, so today around lunchtime, I was looking at strange stats about what people do and what people don't do, and one thing really kind of popped into my mind, which is that 70% of Americans brush their teeth twice a day. That means that 30% doesn't. That's every third person. So on this call, every third person doesn't brush their teeth twice a day. And then I, I, I found this poll and I looked at it in greater detail. And I noticed that they didn't really ask the people, when they ask a question, do you brush your teeth twice a day? What people will usually respond if you think about it is what they typically do, but not what they do every time. So even when have, and, and most of us, and this is obviously not the most pleasant thing to talk about, but most of us have had moments when we thought, oh, I'll just brush my teeth in the morning, you know, or I'll floss in the morning. So it's a habit that's very deeply ingrained. It's a habit that, that at least I ingrained in me, that my parents made sure that I have, that society made sure that I have, because 
you know, brushing teeth is something that we we kind of don't like people who have bad breath. It's, it's a big social no-no. So there's a lot of pressure to make that a big habit. And even with all this pressure, 30% of the people don't have this habit. And even those that do sometimes don't do it. So we are not machines. We will sometimes make mistakes. But when you're making a habit that is supposed to replace a habit that has been present for five years or seven years or 10 years, you have to be very, very mindful about these moments when you say to yourself, nah, I'll do it tomorrow. Obviously, when we talk about introducing a habit, you're not only going to do the, whatever behavior you're replacing picking with, you will not do it only when you have the urge to pick, you will do it in the context because we're trying to establish a habit, not the context is not the urge arising, the context is me being, for example, at work because my office is my context. So I will introduce it as a habit independently of the urge to pick every time I'm in that context. So even if, if skipping a habit doesn't result in picking, you still have to be mindful of how it's developing and what was happening. So just keep an eye on that. If you journal again, journaling is a really good way to track these things. Um, the, the article that you will receive along with the link to the, um, to the YouTube recording of the, of the webinar, uh, the article will, um, will give you a little chart that you can copy about sort of how to establish habits as well. I don't find it super helpful, but some people might. And also be very attentive when your environment is changing and when context is changing. If you're traveling, that's a very high risk situation and there's a very good chance that you will slip. You may think it's not a big deal if I just don't do something for five days, but five days will be seven days and it will be 10 days. So it's very important to assure that when you travel, you kind of take your habits with you. So plan ahead. Plan if you need space to meditate when you travel or if you need a specific environment for your competing responses to work. When you're booking your Airbnb, pay attention to this. So you have to be very proactive about maintaining habits. And then as habits are established, you can stack more habits on top of them. I gave you the example of mindfulness along with my morning routine, for example. When you have a habit that's already well established, then you can insert habits, you can add habits on both ends, you can, you can enrich the, the habit and your lifestyle with more of them. So uh, also one good place to start when you're establishing new habits is to see the context you're in, what routines you already have established. If you're at work, for example, you probably have some daily meetings or some things that you do at the same time or a similar time. That's a really good starting point to implement more habits. So that would be everything that I have to say for today. And um, now we will go on to the Q&A portion. So before I go on, I would just like to say a few words very quickly about SkinPick, since they're allowing us to have these free webinars. So it's an eight week program based on habit reversal training and acceptance and commitment therapy. So both evidence-based treatments for skin picking. It's a type of treatment that's done in writing and you also get a therapist that you can correspond to. Because it's done in writing, it's much more affordable than standard therapy. So if you cannot afford therapy, you know, face-to-face, -face, old fashioned kind of therapy, then skin, skin picking might be a, a good thing for you. So thank you uh, for sticking with me. I know that yet again, I talked more, so I will get your questions right away. 